University of Incarnate Word for sponsoring all of our Zooms uh, for the end of May and, and for the month of June. We appreciate Julie Weber, our board member in uh, the University of Incarnate Word. Uh, this program, which is focusing on uh, the alumni of the Peace Corps um, and other items that they will discuss, is hosted by the World Affairs Council's Young Professionals Committee. Um, and we will talk about that in just a second. Um, before we move on, the, the, there is a Peace Corps link. If you have any questions as we're moving along uh, in the chat room, you are uh, welcome to click on that to get additional information about the Peace Corps. Uh, we really appreciate our members, those who are members of the World Affairs Council. If you are not a member or if you need to renew, please click on the link in the chat room to become a member. Um, and if you would like to make a donation, we'd appreciate uh, an amount that is significant to you to the World Affairs Council. It's tax deductible. And that link is also in the chat room as well. Uh, speaking of members, I'm really excited to have someone on uh, who's who registered who's listening in uh, Marilyn Jacobson he, she's she just renewed her membership but she ran the World Affairs Council in uh, Southern California uh, for 40 years and she's retired here in San Antonio and she's a member of the World Affairs Council um, and uh, my one of my predecessors Elizabeth Costello is also on and my mentor Bill Mull who comes from a, uh, uh, a long time of uh, service and broadcasting, as well as serving the community. So we appreciate that. And also the Office of Congressman Chip Roy is also tuning in. So thank you all so much. Thank you to our Facebook audience as well. Um, Joshua will do the introductions to the panels, uh, to the panelists, as well as Mayor Hardberger. Uh, I do want to mention, this is very special not only to the Peace Corps, to have Mayor Hardberger uh, uh, with us today. He is a board member for the World Affairs Council. He was the recipient of our International Citizen of the Year Award in 2019. Um, and he's done so much stuff in the community. And uh, I, I look forward to hearing his uh, beginnings with the Peace Corps back during JFK's administration. But right now I wanna bring out Sarah Allred, who is the chair of our Young Professionals Committee, who works at Valero, um, who will introduce Joshua. Sarah? Hi, thanks Armin. Well, welcome everyone. Like Armin said, my name is Sarah Allred. I'm the chair of the San Antonio World Affairs Council's uh, Young Professionals Committee. And I do work as a government affairs analyst for Valero here in San Antonio. Thank you very much to our panelists for taking the time today to support World Affairs Council and this programming, which is so important to our committee and our, our community and its young professionals. In the spirit of our panel discussion today, there are likely many of us on the call who have traveled or lived abroad and have had the fortune of experiencing and embracing a new culture. And part of traveling means sometimes opening your eyes to the difficulties of other communities around the world, and the challenges that they face. Uh, my personal perspective about the world was really shaped by my time living in uh, Tegucigalpa, which is the capital of Honduras. And I was there for four years with my family uh, when we were posted there for my dad's job. Um, it was life changing. And you know, at a really young age where you're impressionable as a teenager, um, I fully enjoyed being completely immersed in a new culture, new language, new lifestyle. And I loved every, every experience that that opportunity um, gave me and, and all the lessons I learned. However, it's impossible to not also acknowledge the huge economic disparity between the very wealthy and the extremely impoverished in, in Honduras. And it's thanks to the selflessness and the incredible work of the Peace Corps and organizations like it that really help to improve living conditions in Honduras and countries like it. 
They literally make the world a better place. Um, and it's the importance of hearing from professionals behind this critical work that keeps us all grounded in what's really going on in the world. Programming like this allows us to learn through the lens and the experiences of others. We're able to better understand global challenges and that helps us to shape a more globally minded community here in San Antonio that is based on openness, respect, and a celebration of diversity, which strengthens our community. So no matter if this is your first webinar or you're a loyal follower, you've seen them all, <laughs> um, we're happy to have you. We sincerely hope you enjoy this programming. And if you do, please know that the, these discussions are at the heart of the Young Professionals Committee and the interests of all of our members. So if you're interested in learning more, please reach out to us in the chat room. We'd love to hear from you and connect and hope you'll consider joining our Young Professionals group. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Joshua Castro. He's our current Peace Corps Regional Recruiter for San Antonio and South Texas. Joshua formerly served in Peace Corps Paraguay between 2015 and 2017. And we were thrilled to have him here to lead our discussion today. So with that, Joshua, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the uh, awesome introduction. And uh, it's such a privilege to be here uh, with World Affairs Council and University of the Incarnate Word. Um, so uh, thank you all so much for uh, helping organize us. Uh, I wanted to briefly talk about some of the basics of the Peace Corps before passing it off to uh, Mayor Hardberger and our panelists, um, just in case there's anyone who um, would you know need, needs to know a little bit more about the Peace Corps before we get into our questions. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and please let me know if you all can see it. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Great. So like Sarah mentioned, I was a volunteer in Paraguay from 2015 to 2017 in the environmental sector. Um, a lot of my work involved teaching in four different schools and reforestation projects. Um, I taught English the entire time I was there, put together a curriculum for the professors to use when I was gone. Uh, and this was my beautiful site. I was actually in a World Heritage site in, in Paraguay. And I'm gonna go through these a little, a little quickly because I don't wanna take too much time from our panelists, but um, we are joined by Katie, who will be introducing herself uh, a little later on, but she was an uh, education volunteer in Panama, 2013 to 2015. Uh, Margie and Bill Day, who were health and community economic development volunteers from 66 to 69. And Dr. Doug Hall, who was a volunteer in Guyana from 2013 to 2016 and a volunteer, uh, a second time volunteer in Ukraine from 2016 to 2020 before uh, he was evacuated due to the current uh, COVID-19 crisis. And so what is the mission of Peace Corps? The mission of Peace Corps is to promote world peace and friendship by fulfilling three goals. And the first goal is to help people of interested countries in meeting their need for trained men and women. So we want to be sure that when our volunteers go overseas that uh, they provide the, the men, women, and children there with skills so that when that volunteer returns back home, they still have those skills. Uh, the second goal is to help promote a better understanding of Americans on the part of the people served. Um, and the third goal, to help promote a better understanding of other peoples on the part of Americans. So really, we want someone to, uh, well, we want to build relationships. Right. So while we're overseas and when we're back here in the, in the States, uh, it's all about sharing culture, building relationships um, and helping promote that understanding. So there are about two females in Peace Corps for every male. The age range is 20. Well, the age range is, is basically at least 18 until, um, you know, there, there's no maximum age range. So that's a question that I always get asked. What's the maximum age range? 
And uh, our oldest volunteer up until recently was 86 years old. And our six sectors that we work in are education, which is um, quite a large number of what our volunteers do. Health, uh, so public health, youth and development, community economic development, so our business sector, and environment, agriculture, and then there's something called Peace Corps response, which is really for people who have quite a lot of experience in a, in a certain area that are able to do Peace Corps response. We are all over the world. Um, so this is, uh, you can kind of see Latin America all the way to the Pacific Islands. So, um, you know, again, prior to uh, COVID-19, these were the posts where we had uh, volunteers, but it's just to give you an idea of the, you know, the, the global extent of where we have Peace Corps volunteers. And the benefits, uh, I wanted to touch on this uh, for you all and, and young professionals. So it is fully funded. So it does not cost you, uh, oh, okay, sorry, we just had a question come in. What is an RPCV? Uh, an RPCV is a returned Peace Corps volunteer. So it is someone who finished their Peace Corps service and is now back in the States. So I am technically in our panelists, we are all RPCVs. Um, benefits during service, you have a living stipend that covers your rent, your local travel, um, everything in between. Uh, medical and dental coverage. So again, that's full medical and dental coverage. If there's, you know, ever an incident, um, we have a team of doctors and, you know, they're on call 24 seven and, you know, they will bring you into the, the capital or wherever the Peace Corps headquarters in that country is and really take care of you. So it's nothing out of pocket for you. Uh, you also have 48 vacation days, student loan deferment cancellation. And then of course, you know, three months of training um, to develop your, your skills. <clears throat> the benefits when you finish, um, it's actually $10,000 now that you get in transition funds when you return to the States. That's your money to do whatever you want with. There are graduate school benefits in terms of the, the Coverdell Fellowship, which covers up to 100% of graduate school and you know you, you have that forever. So if I wanted to go back to school in 20 years, um, I could look and see if there's a Coverdell for the program that I want to do. And those covered L's range from law school to health, to education, to computer systems. I mean, there, there's just a wide variety of them. Um, definitely a lot of MBAs and, and things like that. Uh, federal employment advantages. You have a year of a hiring preference if you wanna work for a federal agency. It's called non-competitive eligibility. And there's also public loan forgiveness programs and access to affordable health insurance. So I will not take any more time from our, our panel. And of course, let me stop sharing here. Um, before we get to our panel, I, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce um, the former mayor of San Antonio, um, Mr. Phil Hardberger, former captain in the Air Force, former chief justice of the Fourth Court of Appeals and uh, executive secretary of the Peace Corps under John F. Kennedy's administration. So it's a it's a complete honor to have you here with us and I'll I'll pass it off to you. Thank you, Joshua. It is so much fun to be talking about the Peace Corps again. It occupied some really important years in my life. I loved it. It changed my life as I know it has changed many volunteers' life. Um, I applied for Peace Corps service as a volunteer actually, but uh, that was right at the beginning of the Peace Corps, early in uh, 61, as a matter of fact, March of 61, the Peace Corps officially was founded. Um, about a week or two after that, I applied at the Peace Corps in Washington. I had gone up to see Kennedy's inauguration, and I stayed. Uh, I was there to see the inauguration and become a member of the Peace Corps. Well, it was Bedlam because it's a brand new agency. They had two floors in a high rise that the entire Peace Corps bureaucracy was in. Uh, three or four people would, would have, uh, be sharing the same desk, the same typewriter. Uh, and that's, they were typewriters then, not word processors. So I was interviewed with the interviewer sitting on the edge of the desk and me and the secretary's chair. Um, 
and I heard at the end of that that they would be in touch with me if anything came up, which generally means you're not going to hear anything further. You, you didn't get it. But uh, another six months went by. So now we're at the end of uh, 1961. And I got a call and they said, would you like to come work for the Peace Corps? And at that time, I still was not fully clear on what they were hiring me to do or whether I was going to be a volunteer. But it turned out it was a job. I was paid. I was not a volunteer. But I was with the administration of the Peace Corps. And uh, I had four of the very best years of my life there. And then at the end, I went over to Office of Economic Opportunity, which is an outgrowth of the Peace Corps. We wanted to do in this country what we were doing in the other countries that we were serving in. So I started out as a writer. Uh, I asked them, what is it I'm supposed to write? And they said, whatever needs to be written. That was my job description. So for a while, a year or so, I was just a uh, writer, had my own typewriter, and I would do press releases and sometimes speeches and what have you. Uh, but then I was the uh, head of that department, uh, got cancer and later died. And I became the head of the public information office for the Peace Corps and uh, kept that for about a year. And then I became the congressional liaison for the Peace Corps, which is a fancy name, by the way, for a lobbyist, but it's a lobbyist with one client. That is to say the Peace Corps. And my job was to keep us well funded, keep the congressmen and senators happy. Uh, my last job from that was uh, become executive secretary which sounds probably a little more elevated than it was, but it was a very important position. You had, of course, the director of the Peace Corps, and you had a deputy director, and then you had the area representatives of Asia, Africa, Latin America. But after that, probably it was the executive secretary. The real uh, advantage that I had there was I got to start working for the first time on a day-to-day -day basis with Sergeant Shriver, a person that also influenced a lot of volunteers and influenced me, changed my life really. Uh, never knew anyone quite so talented or so wonderful and fun to be around. But the uh, last two years then I was his, uh, the executive secretary, which meant that all paperwork from staff, domestic or foreign, that was to go to Shriver, went to me first. And I got to read it and then give it to Shriver with any comments that I wanted to make on the proposition that was before him. Uh, he didn't always take my advice, but uh, he took it enough to make me think I was about the luckiest guy in the whole world. Uh, I did travel overseas. I worked in eight different countries when I was, the four years I was in the Peace Corps, sometimes as little as a week, sometimes as much as six weeks which I did in India, uh, and another month I spent in the Dominican Republic over Christmas. Uh, wonderful job, never been able to equal it, even though I have had a successful career. But it, what it really taught me a lot was how wonderful the young people and older people are in America that would serve in such a capacity as this. I can truthfully say I never met a return Peace Corps volunteer that I didn't like and respect. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Mayor. Uh, again, I mean, to, to hear from someone who was there, you know, really around the beginning and, um, you know, with your typewriter and <laughs> to, to hear it from that perspective, uh, it really means a lot to all of us. Um, and, and, you know, you're, support and just being here um, is, is really um, quite amazing. So thank you so much. You're very welcome, Joshua. I might say, I believe, I regretfully think this is the case when uh, Shriver left the Peace Corps and took over OEO, I left to go with him. But at that time, I believe we hit our high water mark. We had 15,000 volunteers serving at that time in 55 different countries. I don't think uh, we've ever equaled it since. I noticed on 
the charts you were showing, it looked like about 7,500 volunteers at the time. Uh, we had 200,000 volunteers at that time, at one time or another, that had already served in the, those four years. Now I see you've got 225,000. Oh, and I think I should probably say this, when we're talking about numbers, Shriver used to say, if we had a million Peace Corps volunteers, we wouldn't have to have a million soldiers. And I used to say, I don't think that's going to be possible. And he always said, everything is possible. You just need to think bigger. But I've often thought since then of what if you had the number of volunteers that we do in our standing army, which is now about one and a half million. Think if you had one and a half million volunteers working throughout the world. You sure would change the world that we know. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, thank you again uh, for that insight um, into, uh, you know, Sergeant Shriver's way of thinking. Uh, pretty amazing. Um, and, and we appreciate you being here. Well, I appreciate having the chance to talk about it. It's fun for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, our PCVs will, will never stop talking about Peace Corps. Um, so, uh, and that's why I got this job, so that I could talk about it and get paid for it. Uh, so I think now I'm going to uh, reintroduce our panelists and ask a couple questions. And if, if anyone on, on Facebook or um, attending the Zoom event has any questions, feel free to, to answer them, uh, uh, ask them in the chat. And um, we'll, we'll get to them as we are going through the, the questions that I've prepared. Okay, so first, I would like to reintroduce our panelists. Um, if you could, uh, we'll start with you, Katie. If you can tell us uh, where you served and what it was that, that you did. Sure. Um, hi, my name is Katie Mirza. I was in Panama from 2013 to 2015 um, as an education volunteer. Um, our project was called Teaching English. And I was there to work with local English teachers. I was in a town about an hour and a half east of Panama City of about 5,000 people um, with one school that was pre-K through eight. Um, and to work with the six English teachers there to try to um, help them plan their lessons, um, try to bring in more creative ideas um, from the classroom that we tend to use more in the US. The kids were doing a lot of uh, memorization and copying um, when I got there. Um, and so it was really a partnership because the teachers who were there knew about how schools worked in Panama. They had many more years of experience teaching than me. Um, but um, I was able to bring in an experience of um, more creative activities um, that made it fun for the kids to learn. A lot of them um, had sort of discounted English as something they weren't good at and then later um, realized that they did like it. Awesome, thank you. And uh, Bill and Margie? Hi, I'm Margie Day. I was a health volunteer. We were in India from 1966 to 1969, <clears throat> and I ran a Hansen's disease or leprosy clinic um, and used that opportunity to do a lot of nutrition teaching, especially for mothers in terms of how they should feed their children and how they could get better nutrition for themselves and their kids. Bill? Uh, I'm Bill Day. Uh, our training was for a rural community development project, which included the health aspect that Margie got involved in. Uh, I was tasked with uh, a uh, chicken uh, project. Uh, what did I know about chickens? Uh, <laughs> uh, however, fortunately, between the time the program was de designed and developed and the time we got there, uh, there was a drought, it didn't rain, so consequently the chickens all died and I was spared uh, having to deal with that failure. Uh, but there not being much water, it gave me an opportunity to look around for another job, which turned out to be digging water wells, or in our case, deepening the ones that already existed. 
uh, and that kept me busy for uh, for a good two years. Uh, other duties as assigned, that was all over the all over the village. Whatever happened, we could get involved in. The most interesting thing I think was periodically uh, we would respond with the district health officer uh, to go out and deal with smallpox outbreaks, uh, which was still very very common then. Um, I. I get a sense of deja vu the past five or six months of what uh, that time was like. But uh, we were bulletproof, uh, and uh, <laughs> we survived, and uh, and we won that one. Uh, smallpox is gone. Mm. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Bill and Margie. And uh, Dr. Hall? Uh, we're talking about service. Yes, if you could tell us uh, where you served. and Well, I ended up in Guyana in South America. Um, when I went into the regional education center, the, they had a new person come in who didn't know who I was, didn't know what Peace Corps was, and didn't know why I was there. And so I had to introduce myself, and I told the education officer, my job is to make you look good. And so I spent three years organizing libraries, doing literacy programs, um, doing just about everything involving education in Guyana. I came home for six weeks, re-signed up, went to Ukraine, where I was at a, I'm at a university. I still consider myself there, uh, teaching information technology and English. Um, teaching the students how to be students. Uh, interestingly, in Ukraine, they refer to university students as children. And I told them I don't teach children, I teach young adults. And showing them all the possibilities that they had, not only in IT, but just in the world. And right now, once they reopen, I'm going back. <laughs> awesome, thank you. And, and Dr. Hall, I, I also wanted to ask you, um, since you, you decided to, you know, you had your career and then you retired and joined Peace Corps. So what were you doing before serving and what motivated you to serve? Okay, well, I was a professor of computer science at St. Mary's here in San Antonio. Um, but uh, Mr. Harberger, back when Peace Corps started in 61, I was 14 and I decided I wanted to join Peace Corps. And two years later, when Kennedy came through San Antonio to develop, to dedicate the Brooks Aerospace Medicine, I met him and was able to shake his hand and say, you know, Mr. President, I'm going to join the Peace Corps. Uh, and then as we know, the next day he was shot. And it took me 50 years. I retired, sold everything I owned and joined the Peace Corps. Awesome. That's uh, you know, an amazing story. Um, thank you for sharing that. And so we had a, we had a question come in. Somebody asked, "What was the most challenging part of your service?" So I'd like everyone to. I'm sure there are a lot of challenges. But I'd like everyone to to answer that. Um, and feel free to just just go ahead and answer. Okay, I'll start since no one else is starting. Um, first thing was patience. I learned to be very patient. Uh, and secondly, to always be nice to people, uh, no matter what, always smile. I was the typical, stereotypical American. I was always smiling, always speaking to everybody. Uh, I used to drive people crazy, but that's okay. That's what I'm there for. Um, and also to listen to what they needed. It, I wasn't there for my needs. I was there for their needs. And many times it was helping them find out what they needed and then help them meet those needs, not solve it for them. I think the biggest challenge, because I was a young American woman, I was used to the American way of life. Indian women do not do all of the things or then certainly did not do all of the things like driving and socializing with men that we did in America. <clears throat> and so that was, that was challenging for me. Um, but I adjusted 
slowly, but I adjusted. Awesome. Maybe yeah. I think what I had heard in popular culture about the Peace Corps was that it was very challenging in terms of hardship, that I would be out in the middle of nowhere with a dirt floor and no electricity or running water, and that it would be very, you know, I might have to bike far to send a letter to my family, um, but really serving in Panama in 2013 was not like that at all. Um, I could easily call the U.S. I actually, I, myself and, and some of those I worked with have traveled multiple times to the U.S. because it was only a few hour flight during our service. Um, but what was surprising to me that was more challenging was just sort of standing out from everyone in my community, kind of having positive attention and people being excited to meet me, but um, I definitely felt exhausted sometimes just sort of re being a representative of the U.S. I mean, once someone was asking a question about what everyone's opinions were and I was about to answer in the teacher's room and then they said, oh, you're an American, you're just open-minded. Like, as I started to feel like I, I wasn't always an individual. Like, how could I form these relationships and not just represent all of the U.S. if I said a certain thing that doesn't mean all Americans think that. Um, people seemed surprised that I liked to read when I'd always been told that was a good thing to do. Um, but sometimes I would come around and see their their point of view. Like I think that my family, uh, my host family felt a little offended if I was spending a lot of time reading because they really valued family and multi-generations of the family and talking to each other. Um, and so that was a, a learning experience, but ended up being more challenging than some of the other things I thought would be hard. Yeah, and good point. Uh, I'll just uh, also touch on this. So we, we all kind of have an idea of what's going to be challenging, but it's often those things that we don't think about that are very challenging. So something for me, never having seen snow growing up in South Florida, um, you'd be surprised how cold it would actually get in Paraguay. And that was that was one of the most challenging things for me uh, was definitely just the weather. Uh, we had a question come in that I just want to take a second to answer uh, from Isabella. She asked, if you take medication regularly, how do you go about filling a prescription and does it vary depending on the location? So good question. When you apply to Peace Corps, you will go through a, a medical clearance. And um, so long as we can get uh, whatever medical needs you have and medications uh, to the Peace Corps posts in that country, um, uh, our team of doctors are able to uh, accommodate you. Um, if for whatever reason uh, we can't get your medication to that country, then it, it won't be a country that you would be considered for. Um, you know, your, your health and your safety is always uh, our number one concern. And let's see. So we'll start with Katie on this one. I think this is really important for the, the young professionals. Um, the next question, how has your Peace Corps service impacted your life and where you are now? Um, so Katie, if you wouldn't mind starting. Yeah, um, I believe Dr. Hall mentioned this. I think the most important thing I learned in Peace Corps was it was really emphasized in our training to do a needs assessment. We were supposed to really focus on that for the first three months which felt like a really long time because everyone had come there because they wanted to be productive and get something done in their community but it really was important it takes quite a while to um, learn the culture learn the different groups that are already working in the community um, and how things work um, and I think I've used that a lot after um, coming back to the US um, I for three years been working in um, immigration policy advocacy um, and I worked inside an immigration detention center providing legal services um, for detained families and it involves a lot of working with different government agencies which you may not always agree with um, but I think having to um, learn how things work and get along with different people in the Peace Corps and uh, assess the situation before jumping in and just assuming um, what's best. I don't know if anyone has seen Volunteers, but they jump right in and build a bridge. Uh, great movie if you haven't seen it. Um, and I always think of that when, when I'm about to uh, jump in. I, I also, on my um, as a volunteer outside of work, I do um, community organizing around immigration issues in San Antonio. 
Um, like we've uh, raised money for undocumented families that didn't uh, receive a, a congressional check during COVID and um, we fight for policies on a local level that help immigrants in our community. And so for all of that work, it's really been a lot of similar skills. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Bill and Margie? Uh, it taught me a lot of patience, uh, whether I wanted to be that taught that or not. It was uh, learning that uh, just because I came from you know, the, the great uh, Walmart in the sky didn't mean that we had everything or all of the answers. Uh, my counterparts had their own way of doing things and at times it would just infuriate me. It says, we've, we've got to get this done. We're going to get this done. And their response was, you yeah, just, just calm down. It's, it's going to be done. Uh, don't, don't be in such a rush. Uh, learning that lesson was difficult. Uh, it was, it was a worthwhile lesson to learn. I, I don't regret anything. Well, there was that dysentery thing, but I won't go into that. Uh, but other than that, I don't regret any part of, uh, of the time that uh, I was in India at all. I think for me, what Dr. Hall was saying about um, listening to other people in my professional life, it taught me lessons in terms of working with others, organizing others, um, and listening to their ideas and, and being kind and patient. So that was it. Joshua, I have, I have a contribution if I may make it. Yes, and that please. Is, I, I think that not everyone realizes the quality of citizenship that is built up in our volunteers and when they come home they make the united states a better place they understand people they understand that bill was talking about patients they understand that uh you have to work together to get anything done and they just make terrific citizens from then on as long as they live and of course many have gone into uh public service there's congressmen, senators, and so forth. But whether they do politics or just their professional life, they have become better, more understanding and perceptive people. Yeah, thank you for, for including that, uh, Mayor. I appreciate it. Well, I think one of the things that I found from the, I was a Peace Corps volunteer leader when I was in Ukraine. And a lot of times the younger volunteers would come in and they say, I don't have any skills. And you would be surprised what skills you do have that can be used in your site. And many times it's just the way you think of things, the way you look at them will be new for them. So skills you have coming through school, through jobs you've had, whatever. A lot of times we take them for granted and they have no idea what it's like. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'll add, the, the mayor brought up a good point. Not only is there professional development, but personal. I mean, you, you come back and, and you've gone through things that um, were very challenging. Um, and, and you come back, uh, whether for me it was confidence. I felt like I had a lot more confidence to handle things. Um, but. Uh, and professionally also, when I finished at the end of 2017, I jumped right back into graduate school. I had a uh, one semester left for my master's in forest resources and conservation. And I, I finished that. And then I got hired by a returned Peace Corps volunteer who worked for the US Forest Service, um, who was looking for someone to help run camps uh, for a program called Kids in the Woods. Um, and I sent her my resume and I, I ran multiple camps as a Peace Corps volunteer, local, um, statewide and national uh, level. And so we started running these camps and actually in the fall, um, the University of Florida brought me on uh, as a lecturer for uh, dendrology, 
uh, tree science. So, um, you know, I, I feel very fortunate, but I know that my uh, return volunteer status and also what I learned through being a volunteer um, was able to, to, you know, get me those positions and beef up my resume a little bit, which was pretty lacking at the time well, before Peace Corps. Um, and, and this is all then before moving out here. So uh, Peace Corps definitely impacted my life. And, you know, I can tell you, and as a first generation um, college student, uh, my goal when I went to college uh, was to be able to help my family financially. Um, and uh, I wasn't doing that when I graduated. I have a bachelor's in anthropology and it was tough. It was tough trying to, you know, claw your way up that ladder. And so I said, well, you know, I've always wanted to do Peace Corps. I'm going to do it and, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens afterwards. And, you know, now I live on my own and I'm able to provide that support to my family, which means uh, everything to me. And so, uh, so I have a couple other questions. We kind of answered one. We talked on personal and, and professional development. Um, but I want to ask, and all of you can feel free and, and Mayor, of course, feel free uh, to answer as well. But what advice would you give to someone thinking about applying to serve in the Peace Corps? I'd tell them to do it as quickly as they can. <laughs> and they'll never regret it. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of a finishing school for life. Uh, kids that go to the, the elite universities, a lot of them go to these preparation schools, get them ready for college, so they'll do well. Uh, I think Peace Corps volunteers, they're, they're going to a similar type of school, except they're getting ready for life itself. And they're learning so many things that will yield them results the rest of their life. I honestly believe my association with the Peace Corps was a reason that I was successful as the mayor of San Antonio. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes, do it. That's, that's <laughs> what the mayor said. I, I've talked to so many people say, oh, well, I've always wanted to do this, but it's like, do it. Whatever you do, just take the chance. It's a two-year service. Uh, you can, most people, I mean, I'm much older and I'm getting up, well, now six years, seven years of my life, but do it. Just say, okay, I'm going to go overseas and I'm going to work and see what I can do to help someone else. Because it will bring, you'll come back with skills that will serve you in everything you do here. Very well said. I agree with every word of that. Yeah. I, Katie? Along the same lines of kind of just do it, even once you're there, someone uh, told us during our training to just say yes to opportunities, even if you're not sure exactly what they are. I think I came from a very American perspective of if someone asked, do you want to come with me? I would say, where are we going? When are we going to come back? What do I need to bring? And people would sometimes be sort of confused with why I had so many questions and needed to know this. And so I think sometimes just letting some of that go. Um, and I had a friend who got in the car with her host mom and didn't know that they were going to go ride around in a boat on the lake one day and didn't bring sunscreen or anything. But, you know, she was okay. And it was a, a good experience. So sometimes just kind of doing opportunities as they come up. I don't think that uh, any of us realize, certainly I didn't, that uh, whatever I, whatever my contribution was to the Peace Corps, I got back 10 times that. Uh, I don't think, of, I can't think of any other event in my life, marriage accepted. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, that has had that impact on me. Uh, and it's, there's probably not, uh, certainly not a week that goes by that something will, I will see or do or say or feel or watch pass in front of me that I look at differently because of what happened to Peace Corps. Coming back to my own country was a much greater learning experience than going to the Peace Corps. 
Yeah, and that's what I would say to anybody who goes into the Peace Corps. You go with an open mind because you know you're going to someplace that's different than your own country. When you come back, you have to come back with an open mind because you look at things very, very differently. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to read something that just came into the chat from uh, Helen. She says, hello all from Brazil. My parents live in San Antonio. My aunt is involved with the World Affairs Council and sent me the link to this webinar. I'm thoroughly enjoying hearing your stories and anecdotes and I can relate to many of them. Peace Corps was a formative experience in my life which directly led to my current career in the, forest, in the foreign service. Great event and keep up the great work. RPCV Mozambique, 2012-2014. Uh, uh, so thank you. Thank you, Helen. That was a really nice comment. Um, let's see here. Katie, I, I wanted to ask you briefly. Uh, let's see. Where did the question disappear? Oh, how safe did you feel while serving? I felt very safe um, in Peace Corps. I was living in a, a small town of 5,000 people. So I don't, in some ways it was safer than living in the U.S. Here in the U.S. I don't really know my neighbors or have people looking out for me, but um, I lived for most of my time. I was um, kind of house sitting for a family who lived in the city and would come out to their hometown sometimes and they had family members all around them. So I was able to live alone, but kind of always feel like there were people looking out for me. I did have uh, some friends, some other Peace Corps volunteers in our group who did have security incidents where maybe the country conditions changed in their area um, and they did have to leave their site um, and they were given the option to um, do work in a, another site um, to finish out their service. Um, and I thought Peace Corps did a, a good job of managing those situations. I was actually the safety warden for my region um, for part of my service. So I was responsible for kind of being um, the person who communicated between Peace Corps and, and anyone in our area if they did have a security incident. Um, my friend who did have to leave her site, they came very quickly, made arrangements very quickly and were very supportive. I knew that I wanted to uh, spend more time outside of the US in another culture in some way. And so doing it through Peace Corps where like you said, Josh, your healthcare is taken care of, your safety is taken care of, um, was a very good way to do it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'll just add that Peace Corps has a safety and security team uh, at every post, just like we have our team of doctors at every post. And, and just like our doctors, they are on call 24 um, seven. Uh, you also go through three months of safety and security and medical training and the safety and security team uh, meets with your host families, inspects your housing, make sure they're up to, to Peace Corps standards. Uh, we had one more question that came through and, and I'd like to, to answer it. Someone asked, how can we contribute, sorry, how can we continue to support and ensure that the Peace Corps remains a public diplomacy tool for future generations? Um, so Peace Corps has, has always had bipartisan support, which is really uh, wonderful. And although now we are in um, difficult times due to you know COVID-19 and such, um, but I would say you know if you want to support Peace Corps, support our mission statement, um, promote uh, world peace and friendship uh, through our three goals, which are again um, working with those overseas, providing them with skills so that. You know, when, when you are no longer there, they still have those skills, they're able to increase their standard of living, and then just building relationships. When you are overseas and you come back, uh, sharing your experience with, with everyone here. Um, there are, are, of course, a lot of misconceptions about uh, people in developing countries, and, and the same can be said for when we go overseas and we're in those countries. Um, we might be the first person who's lived in the United States that people in our communities are meeting, um, you know, and they might uh, have a reference of what an American is by something they've seen on TV or a magazine or something like that. Um, so build those relationships, um, promote, you know, world peace and friendship through our three goals and you will be supporting uh, Peace Corps. Also con uh, write your congressman and write your senator <laughs> in support, please. I mean, yes, of it, but write your congressman. It, it doesn't hurt. 
Um, and so at this time, I'd like to pass it back to uh, the director of the World Affairs Council here, uh, Armin. And so, so thank you, uh, Katie, Dr. Hall, Bill and Margie, and, and of course, Mayor Hardberger, we, we really appreciate having you all. And I'm going to put in the chat, um, Katie, Bill and Margie, and, and Dr. Hall's emails, so, and my own as well. So if anyone has any other questions, uh, please do not hesitate uh, to, to reach out to us and we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Joshua, appreciate that. And, and uh, man, it must be the discipline you learn in, in, as a uh, Peace Corps member, because you, you finished right on time. Uh, I think it's uh, a little luck, actually, because <laughs> this, this is the first time I've done a panel that was uh, completely on time. That's awesome. Uh, there were, <laughs> since we have a few more seconds, there were two questions. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Costello asked about the high school, the, the, the effort to reach out to high school students. Is that something that you all uh, plan or do uh, as, as a recruiter? I think you're on mute, Josh. Yes, yeah, um, I'm happy to. Uh, I am in San Antonio, so if it's a high school in San Antonio, then I, I would be more than happy to to speak to the students. Um, I learned about Peace Corps in elementary school, you know, so so absolutely. Uh, the other question was from Nancy. Uh, pr when you're done with projects overseas, do you come back and and do similar projects or other kind of projects at home? Is there an opportunity to do that? Well, I guess it depends if if you if you'd like to. I've shown presentations where I've built um, eco benches, you know, out of plastic and other materials, and I've I've actually shown those presentations at high schools, and had a lot of interest in building one of those at the high schools, even though we haven't done it yet. But um, certainly, and then you know, uh, skills that I developed in Peace Corps. Um, running camps. I, I've definitely brought those skills here and, and passed them on when we did the, the kids in the woods camps with the Forest Service. Great. When well, I, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, when I came back from Peace Corps, I um, did a master's program and I had a scholarship through the Paul D. Coverdell Fellows Program and that was, we were required to do a certain number of hours in low-income communities as service um, in order to get that scholarship. So there are opportunities like that to continue your work. Thank you, Katie. Appreciate that. Well, um, you know, when I lived in Poland many years ago uh, and walked around the neighborhoods and just started talking to random people, uh, locals, it was such a great way to um, understand their culture, understand wherever they're coming from politically, culturally. And so uh, uh, I look in retrospect, you know, uh, what Mayor Hardberger said of just doing it, I should have just done it at that time. But it's a, it's what a wonderful way to connect people uh, in the US to those abroad. You know, our, the World Affairs Council connects San Antonio to the world and the world of San Antonio. And that seems like it, it would align with what the, uh, what the Peace Corps does, taking into account um, cultural, racial, political differences, which are all global issues that we have. And uh, to be able to serve uh, the, the world with that. I wanna thank Sarah Allred with Valero Energy, who oversees our Young Professionals Group uh, Dr. Hall, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. I've read so much about JFK and for you to have met him the day before, that kind of just sent chills uh, down my back when you were talking about that. What a, uh, what a uh, tragedy, but what a story that you shared. And um, Katie, thank you for sharing your, your, uh, your experiences. Uh, Mr. and uh, Mrs. Day, thank you. Uh, Joshua, appreciate you for moderating. Uh, it finally happened, even even if it couldn't do it in person. Uh, you know, when I talked to Mayor Hardberger about doing this, he didn't bat an eye. He said, "Count me in. Whatever you need, let me know." Uh, and so, I, Mayor Hardberger, I appreciate your support for the uh, World Affairs Council uh, and your proactive involvement in the community. Um, and we're indebted to you for, for your service on so many different levels. 
Um, we had a we had an amazing program today, uh, not only because of the cast you see on 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 your screen, but we had students from all colleges in San Antonio tuning in today, um, and uh, and so uh, we sent it out to the schools and and they sent it out to their students and during their uh, uncertainties and with all the stuff going on around the world, they were able to tune in. But we want to especially thank the University of the Incarnate Word uh, to, for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, we have uh, a couple more this month, um, so keep an eye out for that. And um, membership, look in that chat, lot, chat room, uh, renew your membership or sign online, or if you have a few bucks to throw in the pot, click to make a donation to the World Affairs Council of San Antonio. I wanna thank all of you for tuning in on Facebook Live. Uh, Julie from UIW, Magdalena for uh, uh, helping out behind the scenes, Joshua for moderating, and all of you for your questions. Please support the council, it's important during these times and uh, we will see you on the next program. I will include Joshua's email in my communication to everyone. So if you have questions, you could directly email him. With that being said, you guys have a great rest of the week and thank you again. Thank you, take care everyone.